So today we're continuing our series looking at the big story of the whole Bible from Genesis through to Revelation. And today we're going to be diving into the Exodus story. Uh, what is the Exodus? Uh, I think anyone who's uh, seen the film The Prince of Egypt probably already knows. Uh, but the story picks up around 400 years after the time of Joseph. The descendants of Jacob, uh, now known as Israel, uh, are slaves in Egypt. The dating of the Exodus isn't that easy, uh, as it seems that Egyptian chronology is patchy uh, with various uh, intermediary periods and things. And so some uh, Egyptologists have even suggested alternative dates for pharaohs or whole dynasties of pharaohs in their own revised chronologies. But if we just use the standard dating, uh, there's a, an early date of a hundred and uh, no, sorry, one thousand four hundred and forty-six BC under Pharaoh Amenhotep II. Uh, he's well known for his military sort of expansion campaigns into Canaan, uh, but after one thousand four hundred and forty-six BC, his military activities in the area cease. Uh, perhaps consistent with his army being destroyed in the Red Sea. Also, his eldest son isn't the one who inherits the throne afterwards, as perhaps he was the victim of the 10th plague. There is also another date, uh, a later date that some scholars give of 1290 BC under Ramses II. And that's the version that is in Prince of Egypt with Ramses. Uh, there are also other Egyptologists, such as David Rolls' revised chronology, which places Exodus under a different pharaoh of Dedemus II. Uh, I'm more inclined to go with the early date, uh, just as it seems to have the most sort of archaeological evidence. However, in one way, it really doesn't matter the dating of the Exodus, only that it happened. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, Paul writes, These things happened as examples for us, so that we will not crave evil things as they did. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, he adds, These things happened to them as examples and were written for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages have come. So the purpose of the Exodus narrative is to be an example for us. And it provides instruction about God, about reality and about his plan and his purpose. And that's it. His purpose. It, the Exodus story is to be an example. That's why it's there. OK, so that's its primary purpose. OK, the Exodus is God's deliverance of his people. Israel out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land. Now there's two major themes in scripture, exile and exodus, traveling away from God and then traveling back to God. And it's the story of your soul. It's the story of every soul, my soul, our own ex exile from the presence of God and our own exodus out of that bondage back towards God. In Romans eleven thirty six, Paul writes, for from him, through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That's what the whole sweep of history is for. From him, through him, and ultimately to him. The story of exile and exodus back to God. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 28 put it this way, and when all things are subjected to him, that's Christ, then the son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him so that God might be all in all. That's the end goal of history. The currents are all flowing downhill towards God becoming all in all. Is God all in you today? Is he your all? 
one day he will be friends. One day he's going to be all in all. In the words of um, Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on the earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that's the end of history, folks, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ must reign until all offer him their allegiance so that every knee will bow and that God will become all in all. Amen. So that's the grand sweep. So in my Genesis sermon, I mentioned God's plan and his purpose in choosing Abraham was so that all of the nations would be blessed through him. The purpose of Israel's election was that all the nations would find their way back to God because God's ultimate aim is that he would become all in all. So one thing to remember when regarding Exodus is that all of us are in exile. Adam and Eve, their names mean human and life. We're all exiles from Eden, from the presence of God. Cain, from his family to the land of wandering. All of humanity exiled at the Tower of Babel, meaning the gate of God. All of us have been exiled from the gateway of God. The nation of Israel is in exile from the land of promise that was given to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Not only are they exiles in Egypt, but they're enslaved. And that is our story as well. We're enslaved to powers, to, to sin, to death, to the unseen spiritual forces. We need our own exodus. We need a way out of this bondage. And we're told that when Pharaoh decides to kill all of the infant male Hebrew slaves, he's trying to exercise a form of birth control over his slave population. He doesn't want the, the slaves growing too large, too populous, so they all rise up and overtake Egypt. And we're told, however, that an Israelite mother throws her boy into the Nile River in a basket and he floats safely down the river into Pharaoh's own family as he's adopted into the royal court. And he's named Moses. And he grows up to become the man that God is going to use in order to overcome Pharaoh's evil heart. I'm sure many of us know the rest of the story. In the words of A.W. Tozer, after running from Egypt, Moses went for a postgraduate course, more beneficial than his education at the feet of the great teachers of Egypt. He went to the school of silence, to the sheep and the stars in the heavens above. All through the evenings before sleep overtook him, he listened to the silence and learned to know himself. Moses encountered God there in the wilderness as a burning bush where he's given a mission to go and set Israel free. And we read in Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything that I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. So Pharaoh uh, was considered by his people to be an incarnation of the falcon-headed god Horus in life. And thus we have a scene of God preparing for war by making Moses like God to Pharaoh. Moses is taking on that role of being the image of God to the false god, Pharaoh. And God adds that Aaron is going to be your prophet. So we see here Moses is commissioned. He's sent out by God to act on God's behalf as God himself, as the image of God, to Pharaoh. And he even has his own prophet, Aaron, his brother. So we see here that Moses is installed as God's visible representative. And who are the main enemies in this story? If we read Exodus 12, verse 12, 
we read regarding the final plague. On that night I will pass through the land of Egypt, strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in all the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. So the judgment, and if we think of all the plagues in this way, is upon the gods of Egypt. And Pharaoh as a false god of Horus incarnate. So the Exodus is the story of liberation from the power and dominion of false gods. It's a rescue story by the one true God who wants a people for himself so that the nations can be blessed. So that he might become all in all. So each of the ten plagues that God gives upon Egypt is judgment upon particular Egyptian gods. The Nile turning to blood is a judgment upon Happy, the god of the Nile. Frogs invading the land is a judgment upon Hechet, the, the goddess of birth, who's got a frog's head. The, the plagues keep coming and coming and coming until finally darkness and death come. And God is telling Egypt, he is the one who has the power over all of the forces of nature, not the so-called gods who they are receiving their sacrifices and their offerings. The Exodus is spiritual warfare. That's what it's all about. It's a war on the gods of Egypt by the one true God. And friends, just as Israel was enslaved to false gods, so too were our ancestors as they worshipped beasts and trees and and you know images that looked like men and women so too our own hearts and minds are enslaved to the things of this world saint augustine of hippo wrote in his confessions late have i loved you O beauty ever ancient ever new late have i loved you you were within me but i was outside and it was there that i was searching for you in my unloveliness, I plunged into the lovely things that you had created. You were with me, but I was not with you. Created things kept me from you. And yet, if they had not been in you, they would not have been at all. You called, you shouted, you broke through my deafness. You flashed, you shone, you dispelled my blindness. You breathed your fragrance upon me. I drew in breath and now I pant for you. I've tasted you and now I hunger and I thirst for more. You've touched me and I burn for your peace. It's the story of every soul as we become enloved and enraptured with God as we find him. God, in judging the gods of Egypt, the superpower of the ancient world, is showing his rescue power. This is not the story of conquerors, but the story of slaves. God's heart of love and compassion for those in slavery, for those in bondage, for the poor, for the impressed of this world. The God listens to their cry. When Paul, like Moses, meets Christ as a, a light in the wilderness in Acts 26 18 he he's given his own prophetic mission to the nations with these words to open their eyes turn them from darkness to light from the power of satan to god so that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me this is the second exodus for all of the nations of the world liberation to those who are in spiritual bondage and captivity to the powers of darkness in hebrews 2 14 to 15 we read since the children have flesh and blood he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is the devil and free those who all their lives are held in slavery by their fear of death. So Christ came to set you free from spiritual slavery. You no longer need to fear death, to cling on to the created things of this world, rather to cling to the uncreated creator, the source of all life. The final plague is when God turns the table on Pharaoh. Just as he killed the sons 
of the Israelites, so God is going to kill the firstborn of, in Egypt with a final plague. And whilst Pharaoh doesn't allow any escape, God provides a means of escape through the blood of the Lamb. And this event becomes the foundation of Israelite identity, one that they're going to symbolically reenact every year in memory of this event. And that's the Passover festival celebrated each spring. And on the night before Israel left Egypt, they sacrifice a young spotless lamb. None of its bones are broken and they paint its blood all around the corners of the door. And then when the plague comes over Egypt, the houses covered in the blood of the lamb are passed over and the sun inside is spared. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul writes plainly, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. John the Baptist, when he meets Christ at his baptism, declares him as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ is compared to the Passover lamb who is killed so that we might be set free. He even died during the festival of Passover as it's going on in Jerusalem. His blood wards off death itself and assures us the hope of the resurrection. As we ritually eat our own Passover lamb every Sunday in Holy Communion, the cross, the symbol of death, has become the symbol of victory. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, we're told, Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. So if that's the case, the story of the Exodus is literally the story of God saving his firstborn son from the power of death. And that is also the Christian story. That's what the resurrection is about. Peter in Acts 2, 22, 20, 23, 24, sorry, puts it this way. The man, this man, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Friends, God raised Jesus from the dead. He rescued his firstborn son from the power of death. It's the story of Israel. It's the story of Jesus Christ. And so we're told that when the Israelite slaves make their exodus out of Egypt, only to be trapped by the Red Sea, Pharaoh, who's now changed his mind, once again gathers his army. And he chases after the Israelites for the final showdown. And the Red Sea parts and Israel passes through on dry land whilst the armies of Pharaoh are destroyed in the sea. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 2, Paul writes, In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptised as followers of Moses. So here Paul is making a, a clear connection between baptism and the Red Sea. He says they're baptised as followers of Moses. And for each of us, baptism is that moment when we pass from death to life, the realm of Satan to the realm of Christ. We join this new community. We're set free from the old powers, the ones ruled over us. It's our own personal exodus from the powers and the principalities, the false gods that rule over the nations. And in Exodus 12, 38, we're told that a mixed multitude left Egypt in the Exodus. This is important as there are people in the Exodus story who are not physical descendants of Abraham at all, who even become leaders within Israel. It's got nothing to do with their DNA. It has everything to do about ritual participation. To become an Israelite, you're circumcised, you eat the Passover, and that's it. Just as Christians are, have baptism and then eating of Holy Communion. The two most obvious examples of this are Caleb and Phineas. Caleb is called an elder of the tribe of Judah. He's one of the two good tri good spies who in Numbers 13, 6, he, he's referred to as a Kenizzite. That's one of the Canaanite tribes. 
So this elder of the tribe of Judah is ethnically a Canaanite. The other example is Phineas, whose name literally means the black man or the Nubian. Uh, yet he is spoken of as Aaron's grandson of the tribe of Levi. And later he would even become high priest over Israel. Yet ethnically, he's a black African. He's the black man, the Nubian, who's become high priest over Israel. What mattered was ritual identity. He joined Israel. They're circumcised. They participate in Passover. Caleb and Phineas are no less the sons of Abraham by faith than anyone else. The Exodus story is deliverance from death, deliverance from hostile gods, the creation of a new people, a mixed multitude as a type, as a shadow, as example of the new community that is going to be formed by Israel's Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And this is where the Exodus story becomes your story. Like the Israelites, you also have been exiled from the presence of God. You were in bondage and slavery to false gods. And yet Christ, the Passover lamb, was slain for you. He's your liberator. Baptism is your Red Sea crossing. You go into the wilderness wandering period of your life as we're fed by the bread of heaven, by Christ himself. And we receive his Torah, his law, and we enter into becoming a new way of being human. We're on our way to the promised land where death will be no more to receive an inheritance in the age that is to come, where every knee will bow and God will become the all in all. So in conclusion, friends, there's two major themes of scripture, exile and the exodus traveling away from god and then traveling back to god it's the story of your soul the story of your soul your story and my story the exodus is the story of us returning to god out of the control and the power of dominion of false gods aw tozer once said no adequate view of human nature is possible until we believe that we came from God and should go back to God again. This is our own Exodus story, thanks to Jesus, the Messiah, as our means of returning back to the Father who made us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the richness of the Exodus and how the story of the Exodus plays and replays throughout all of Israel's story and into our own story as we who are from the nations have received our own Exodus in baptism out from the power and control of the false gods back to the one true God. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Amen.